The Eighth Sermon, the Apostles' Creed, Articles 5 to 8. Of the latter articles of Christian faith contained in the Apostles' Creed, let us first of all pray to our God that He will grant us a happy, speedy, and very fruitful proceeding in the declaration of the other articles of Christian belief. The fifth article of our belief is, the third day he rose again from the dead. And this article of our belief, truly, is in a way the chief of all the rest. Neither are the apostles so busily occupied in declaring and confirming the others, as they are in this one. For it would not have been enough if our Lord had only died, unless he had also risen from the dead again. For if he had not risen from the dead, but had remained still in death, who would have persuaded us that sin was purged by the death of Christ, that death was vanquished, that Satan was overcome, and hell broken up for the faithful by the death of Christ? Yes, truly, we have foolish fellows who would never cease to blaspheme the true God, to mock our hope, and say, Tosh, whoever returned from the dead to tell us whether there is life in another world after this or not, and what kind of life it is. Therefore, because we cannot find any man who ever returned from the dead, it is to be doubted what these babblers tattle, touching the life of the world to come. That the Lord might therefore declare to the whole world, that after this life there is another. And that the soul does not die with the body, but remains alive, he returned the third day to his disciples, alive again. And at that instant he showed them that sin was purged, death disarmed, the devil vanquished, and hell destroyed. For the sting of death is sin, or the reward of sin is death the devil has the power of death, and he shuts men in hell for sins. Now therefore, in Christ rising alive again from the dead, death could have no dominion over him. And because death is broken by allowing the Lord to pass, it must follow that the devil and hell are vanquished by Christ, and lastly, that sin, the strength and power of them all, is purely purged. It is evident, therefore, that the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ certifies and by seal assures us of our salvation and redemption, so that now we cannot doubt it any longer. We therefore confess in this article that our Lord Jesus Christ is risen again, and that he is risen again for our benefit, that is to say, that he has wiped away our sins, and for us he has conquered death, the devil, and hell, according to the saying of the Apostle. God has saved us, and has called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and favor, which was given to us through Jesus Christ before all beginning, but is declared openly now by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has truly put out death, and brought forth life, light, and immortality by the gospel. 2 Timothy 1 9 and 10. There are many more like this in the fourth chapter of his epistle to the Romans, and in the fifteenth chapter of 1 Corinthians. For the Lord also says in the Gospel of St. John, I am the resurrection and the life, he that believes in me, although he is dead, shall live, and everyone that lives and believes in me shall not die forever. John 11 25 and 26. Now also let us thoroughly consider every word of this article severally by itself. We confess the Lord's resurrection. But a resurrection means to rise again. That rises, which falls. The body of Christ fell, therefore the body of Christ rises, yes, it rises again that is to say, the very same body of Christ which both lived and stirred before it fell, now rises again. I say, it both lives and stirs again. For Tertullian said truly about the resurrection of the flesh, that this word resurrection is not properly spoken of anything, except what first fell. For nothing can rise again except what fell. For we say the resurrection is made by rising again, because it fell. This syllable re is never added except when a thing is done again. This is why the women in the gospel, when they went to anoint the body of the Lord which hung upon the cross, heard the angel of the Lord say, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen, etc. Luke 24 5 and 6
This history of the Lord's resurrection is set forth in the 24th chapter of Luke and the 16th chapter of Mark. Peter the Apostle, in the second chapter of the Acts, Acts 2.25. Also affirming the Lord's resurrection by the testimony of David, expressly shows that the Lord is truly risen again. According to this, we again say that he is risen out of or from the dead, this expresses the truth both of his death and resurrection. For the body or flesh dies, or is destroyed, but being dead, it is raised up again, this body, or flesh, is therefore raised up again. It is as though someone confessing his belief were to say, Our Lord died in the very same condition of nature that other mortal men die, but he did not tarry, nor stick fast among the dead. For the very same mortal flesh which he had taken to himself, and had laid aside by dying, he now takes up again, immortal as David foretold saying, You will not leave my soul in hell nor permit your Holy One to see corruption. Psalm 16.10 For Christ is the first begotten of those who rise again, that in him, as the head, there should be declared what sort of resurrection all Christ's members will have in the day of judgment. And we confess that this resurrection was made the third day, I mean the third day after his death. For upon the day of preparation Mark 15:42, he is taken down from the cross and carried into a sepulcher, where his body rests the whole Sabbath day. About the beginning of the first day of Sabbaths, John 21, which I say, is the first day of the week, called Sunday among us today, in the morning, he arose again from the dead. In the twelfth chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew, we read that the Lord said, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Yet notwithstanding, in the sixteenth and twentieth chapters, expounding himself as having spoken that by Synecdoche, he says, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the scribes and elders, and be killed and be raised up again the third day. The sixth article of our faith is, He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. That body, which is of the same substance as our bodies, taken out of the Virgin Mary, and taken truly from the substance of the Virgin, and which hung upon the cross, and died, and was buried, and rose again the very same body, I say, ascended into the heavens, and sits at the right hand of God the Father. For after the span of forty days, our Lord had abundantly enough instructed his disciples touching the truth of his resurrection and the kingdom of God, and was taken up into heaven. By that ascension of his, he declares to the whole compass of the earth, that he is Lord of all things, and that all things that are in heaven and on earth are subject to him that he is our strength, the power of the faithful, and the one of whom they have to boast against the gates of hell. For, ascending into heaven, he has led captivity captive, Ephesians 4 8, and by destroying his enemies, he has enriched his people on whom he daily heaps his spiritual gifts. For he sits above, so that by pouring his virtue from there into us, he may quicken us with spiritual life, and deck us with sundry gifts and graces, and lastly, defend the church against all evils. For God is our Savior, King, and Bishop. Upon this, as once the Capernates were offended because the Lord had called himself the bread of life that came down from heaven to give life to the world, he says, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascend there, where he was before? John 6 61 and 62 it is as though he said, Then truly you will gather by my quickening, resurrection, and glorious ascension into the heavens, that I am the bread of life, brought down from heaven, and now taken up again into the heavens, there to remain the Savior, life, and Lord of heaven and earth. Moreover, St. Peter the Apostle in the Acts says, Let all the house of Israel know for a surety, that God has made the same Jesus, whom you have crucified, Lord and Christ. Acts 2.36 Furthermore, he not only rose again from death and came to his disciples, but he also ascended into heaven as they beheld and looked at him, 
to the end that we might thereby be assuredly certified of eternal salvation. For by ascending, he prepared a place for us, he made ready the way that is, he opened the very heavens to the faithful. God has placed in heaven the very humanity that he took of us. This is indeed a living and unreprovable testimony that all mankind shall at the last be translated into heaven also. For the members must be made conformable to the head. Christ, our head, is risen again from the dead, therefore we, his members, shall also rise again. And even as a cloud took the Lord away from the sight of his disciples, so we who believe, shall be carried in the clouds to meet the Lord, and be whole in soul and body, and forever dwell in heaven with our head and Lord, Christ Jesus. And John evidently teaches this in his fourteenth chapter, where the Lord says, I go to prepare a place for you, and will come again to you, and take you to myself, that wherever I am, you may also be. Paul the Apostle also witnesses and says, We who live, and are remaining at the coming of the Lord, shall be carried in the clouds together with those who are raised up from the dead, to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4 17 We can confess in this article, therefore, that Jesus Christ, being taken up into heaven, is Lord of all things, the King and Bishop, the Deliverer and Savior of all the faithful in the whole world. We confess that in Christ, and for Christ, we believe the everlasting life which we will have in this body at the end of the world, and in soul as soon as we have departed out of this world. But by the way, we must now weigh the specific words of this article. We say, He ascended. I ask, Who ascended? He that was born of the Virgin Mary, who was crucified, dead, and buried, who rose again from the dead, he I say, ascended truly, both body and soul. But where did he ascend? Into heaven. Heaven in the scriptures is not always taken in one signification. First, it is put for the firmament, and that large compass that is over our heads, in which the birds fly to and fro, and in which the stars are placed, they are called the furniture and host of heaven. For David says, God is clothed with light as with a garment, he spreads out the heaven as if it were a curtain. He also says, I see your heavens, the work of your fingers, and the moon and stars which you have laid. And again, who covers the heaven with clouds, and prepares rain for the earth. And again, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows dot forth the works of his hands. Then also, heaven is taken for the throne and habitation of God. And lastly, it is taken for the place, seat, and receptacle of those who are saved, where God gives himself to be seen and enjoyed by those who are his. For David says, witnessing again, the Lord has prepared his seat in heaven. Psalm 103 19 Upon this the Lord says in the Gospel, Do not swear by heaven, for it is God's seat. Matthew 5:34. And the Apostle Paul says, We know that if our earthly mansion of this tabernacle is destroyed, that we have a dwelling place forever in heaven, built by God, not made by hands. 2 Corinthians 5:1. And therefore, in this signification, heaven is called the kingdom of God, the kingdom of the Father, joy, happiness, and felicity, eternal life, peace and quietness. And although God is not indeed shut up in any place, for he says, Heaven is my seat, and the earth is the footstool of my feet Isaiah 66 1, yet because the glory of God shines in the heavens most of all. And because he lets himself be seen in heaven and enjoyed by those who are his, according to that saying, we shall see him even as he is. 1 John 3 2, and again, no man shall see me and live, says the Lord Exodus 33 20, God is therefore said to dwell in heaven. Moreover, Christ our Lord, touching his divinity, is not shut up in any place, but according to his humanity, once taken on, which he drew up into heaven, he is in the very local place of heaven, 
nor meantime is he here on earth and everywhere bodily. But being severed from us in body, he remains in heaven. For he ascends which means, leaving what is below, he goes to what is above. Christ therefore, leaving the earth, has placed a seat for his body above all heavens. Not that he is carried up beyond all heavens, but because, ascending above all the circles into the utmost and highest heaven, he is taken, I say, into the place appointed for those who are saved. For Paul the Apostle, speaking plainly enough to be understood, says, Our conversation is in heaven from where we look for the Savior to come, etc. Philippians 3.20 In the same manner also, Luke the Evangelist says, And blessing them, he departed from them, and was carried into heaven. Luke 24.51 But why do I make so much ado about expounding what is most evidently declared in the very creed, by that which follows? For the next statement is, He sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. By this we understand what kind of place heaven is, and what our Lord does in heaven. Surely it is not for our frailty, to over-narrowly seek out or discuss the secrets of heaven, and yet it is not against religion to inquire about what is taught to us in the scriptures, and to perfectly remember it as it is taught to us. Our Lord is simply said to sit, and that too, is to sit at the right hand of the Father Almighty. Let us therefore see what the right hand of the Father is, and what it means to sit at the right hand of the Father. The right hand of the Father in the Scripture has two significations. First, the right hand of God is the place appointed for those who are saved, and their everlasting felicity in heaven. St. Augustine set this down to be marked long before us. In the 26th chapter of his book De Gon Cristiano, he writes that the right hand of the Father is the everlasting felicity given to the saints, even as the left hand is most rightly called the continual misery allotted to the ungodly not that by this means, as to what I said. The right or left hand is to be understood in respect to God himself, but in respect to his creature's capacity. And St. Augustine spoke this according to the scriptures. For David says, The path of life you shall make known to me, the fullness of joys is in your sight, and at your right hand is gladness forever. Psalm 1611 What else is this, if not to say, You will bring me into life, I say, into the very heavens, where I will be filled with joys, both by seeing and beholding you, and also by enjoying you for at your right hand in eternal blessedness, are joys everlasting. In the Gospel also, we read that the sheep are placed by the judge at the right hand, and the goats at the left. Matthew 25 33 And when the right hand is taken in this sense, then to sit signifies to rest from all labors, and to live quietly, and in a happy state. For that saying in the prophet is very well known, A man shall sit under his vine, Micah 4.4, 4, as if he had said, All things will be at peace in safety and at quiet. So then, what I have said is meant by the right hand of the Father. And where we confess that the Son sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty, we acknowledge that our Lord, being delivered from all trouble and mortal infirmities, now in his humanity, both rests and rejoices in the specific local place of heaven. Where we believe that both our souls and bodies shall be and live forever. For in the Gospel, the Lord Himself witnesses that there are many mansions in His Father's house, which He goes to prepare, so that they may have a place. And although He departed, yet He would return to them again, and take them to Himself, that where He is, they also might be in the same place with Him. John 14 2 and 3 this is why we believe that Christ is at rest in heaven, where he has prepared a place of rest for us also, to remain in joys everlasting. And because our bodies will not be in felicity everywhere, but only in the appointed place, St. Augustine therefore truly says that, Christ our Lord, according to the measure of his body, is in some one place of heaven. 
Saint Cyprian says, to sit at the right hand of the Father, is the mystery of his flesh taken up into heaven. Secondly, the right hand of God is used for the virtue, kingdom, protection, deliverance, and power of God. For David says, the Lord's right hand is high, the Lord's right hand does mighty things. Psalm 118 16. And Moses said, Your right hand, Lord, is magnified in power, your right hand, O Lord, has broken the enemy. Exodus 15 6. And when the right hand is used in this sense, then to sit signifies to reign, to deliver, to use power, and to do the office of a prince. For David says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Psalm 110 1. And the prophet Zechariah says, Behold the man who is called the branch, he will bud out of his place, and build the temple of the Lord, and sit and rule upon his throne, and be a priest upon his seat. Zechariah 6 12 and 13. In this sense, the right hand of God is infinite, and not contained in any measure of place. Although we confess that our Lord sits at the right hand of the Father, we profess that the Son is exalted above all things, having all things subject under himself, as Paul says in his first chapter to the Ephesians. And finally, the Son, being so exalted, can do all things. He reigns in the universal church, delivers those who are his, makes intercession to the Father in heaven, and in the power of his Godhead, he is present in all places. Therefore, the creed adds almightiness to this sitting of his, where it is said, he sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty. And in St. Matthew the Lord says, To me is given all might in heaven and on earth, go therefore, and bring all nations to me. Matthew 28 18 and 19 So then, I suppose that I have thus briefly well declared what manner of place heaven is, namely, a place of quietness, joy, and everlasting felicity, in which the Son of God sits, dwells, and is in his humanity. And we who are the members of Christ, shall also be in the very same place without any dolor and grief, in joy forevermore. And although our Lord is delivered from all grievous business, yet we do not mean that he sits idly leaning on his elbows. For he is a king, a priest, and very God in the very temple of God, he cannot help but choose therefore, of his natural property and office, to work salvation in the elect, and do all things that lie in his hand to do as God, king, and priest. So then, now we all know what our Lord does as he sits in heaven. Nor is it any trouble at all for him to do, and to work what he does, for he does not work out of compulsion, but naturally, and of his own accord. Thus, and not otherwise, the ancient interpreters of the Holy Scriptures handled this article of our belief. I will allege some of their testimonies here. St. Jerome, in his exposition of Paul's first chapter to the Ephesians, says, He has declared the power of God by the similitude of a man, not because a seat is placed, and God the Father sits on it, having his Son sitting there with him, but because we cannot otherwise conceive how the Son judges and reigns, except by such words applied to our capacity. And therefore, to be next to God or to depart far from Him, is not to be understood according to the distance of places, but according to men's merits, because the saints are heard by Him, but the sinners, of whom the prophet says, Behold, those who go against you shall perish, Isaiah 41 11. Are removed so far as not to come near Him at all. So likewise, to be either at the right or left hand of God is to be taken in such a way, that the saints are at his right hand and sinners at his left. As our Savior himself also says in the Gospel, affirming this, that at the right hand are the sheep, and the goats at the left. Moreover, this very word to sit argues for the power of a kingdom, by which God is beneficial to those on whom he grants to sit, insomuch as truly he rules them and always has them in his guidance, and turns to his own beck or government. The next of those who previously ran out of the way at random, and at liberty. St. Augustine in his book Defied E.T. Symbolo, says, 
we believe that he sits at the right hand of God the Father. Yet not as though we thought that God the Father is comprehended within the limits of a man's body, so that those who think of him should imagine that he has both a right and a left side. And even though it is said that the Father sits, we must not suppose that he sits with bent hams, lest perhaps we fall into the same sacrilege for which the Apostle curses those who have changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the similitude of a corruptible man. For it is a detestable thing to place God in such a likeness in a Christian church. And it is much more wicked to place it in the heart, where the temple of God is truly and indeed, if it is cleansed from earthly desires and error. We must therefore understand that at the right hand is the same as saying in greatest happiness, where righteousness and peace and gladness are, even as the goats are placed at the left hand, that is, where they are in misery for their iniquities, to their pain and torment. Although God is therefore said to sit, this does not mean placing his limbs, but his judicial power, which his majesty never lacks in bestowing worthy rewards on those who are worthy of them, etc. The blessed Bishop Fulgentius, in his second book to King Trasimundus, says, The Lord, to show that his humanity is local, says to his disciples, I ascend to my Father, and to your Father, my God and your God. John 20 17 And a little after, declaring the incomprehensibility of his Godhead, he says to his disciples, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The blessed martyr and bishop of Trent, Vigilius, in his first book against heresies, says, This was to go to the Father, and to depart from us, to take out of this world the nature which he took of us. You see therefore, that it was proper for the same nature to be taken away, and to depart from us, according to the words of the angels who said, This Jesus, who is taken up from you, shall come again, even as you see him go into heaven. Acts 1.11 for see the miracle, see the mystery of both his properties. The Son of God in his humanity is departed from us, but according to his divinity, he says to us, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. If he is with us, then how can he say, The time will come, when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it? He is both with us, and not with us, because those whom he has left and departed from in his manhood, he has not left or forsaken in his Godhead. This is what he says. The seventh article of our faith is this, from there he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. In the former articles is set forth and confessed the divine goodness, bountifulness, and grace in Christ. Now the divine justice, severity, and vengeance that is in him is also declared. For there are two comings of our Lord Jesus Christ. First, he came basely in the flesh, to be the Redeemer and Savior of the world. The second time, he will come gloriously in judgment, to be a judge and revenger who will not be entreated against all unrepentant sinners and wicked doers. And he will come out of heaven, from the right hand of the Father, in his visible and very human body, to be seen by all flesh, with the incomprehensible power of his Godhead, and attended to by all the angels. For the Lord himself says in the gospel, They shall see the Son man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trump, etc. Matthew 24 30 and 31. But now, to judge is to sit in the tribunal seat, to hear and discuss. But now, to judge is to sit in the tribunal seat, to hear and discuss matters, to address strifes, to determine and give sentence, and lastly, to defend and deliver and again, to chastise and punish, and by that means, to keep under and suppress injury and malice. We therefore believe that our Lord Jesus Christ in that day, will deliver all the godly, and destroy all the wicked, according to the words of the Apostle, who says, Our Lord shall be revealed from heaven with the angels of his power, with a burning flame, and shall lay vengeance on those who have not known God. 2 Thessalonians 1 7 and 8. Again, the same just judge shall give a crown of righteousness to all those who love his coming. 2 Timothy 4 8. 
The writings of the evangelists and apostles tell us that the manner of this judgment will be in this way. Once the wickedness of this world comes to the full and Antichrist has deceived the world, so that there is but little faith remaining, and the wicked say, Peace and quietness, then a sudden destruction will come. For our Lord, the Judge, will send his archangel to blow the trump, and to gather together from the four winds, all flesh to judgment. Shortly after, the Judge himself will follow, our Lord Jesus Christ, with all the host of heaven. And he will descend out of heaven into the clouds. And sitting aloft in the clouds as in a judgment seat, he will easily be seen by all flesh. Those who are then living at the day of judgment, will be changed in a very prick of time, and stand before the judge, and all the dead will rise up again in a moment. Then the judge will divide the sheep from the goats, and according to justice, he will give judgment with the sheep and against the goats, saying, Come, you blessed, etc., and go, you cursed, etc. Execution will follow shortly after. For the sheep will later be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and will joyfully ascend with him into heaven, to the right hand of God the Father, there to live forever in glory and gladness. The bottom of the earth will gape for the wicked, and will suck them all up horribly, and send them down to hell, there to be tormented forever with Satan and his angels. All this will be done, not by any long, troublesome, or changeable process, as is used in our courts of law, but in the twinkling of an eye. For then all men's hearts will be laid open, and every man's own conscience will accuse himself. This is set out more largely in Matthew 24 and 25, Wisdom 3 and 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5, Romans 2, 2 Peter 3, etc. Now we simply confess that the quick and the dead will be judged. Some expound this from the godly and ungodly. But the symbol or creed was ordained for the simplest of understanding, and simple things are most fit to teach simple men. Therefore we simply say that the dead are all those who from the beginning of the world, even until the last day, have departed out of this mortal life. And the living are those who at that day will still be alive in this world. For the Apostle says, Behold, I tell you a mystery, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed by the last trump, in a moment of time, and in the twinkling of an eye. For the trump will sound, and the dead will rise again incorruptible, and we will be changed. 1 Corinthians 15 51 and 52 and again, the same apostle says in another place, This I say to you in the word of the Lord, that we who will live and be remaining at the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who are asleep. Because the Lord himself will come down out of heaven with a great noise, and the voice of an archangel, and the trump of God. And first the dead in Christ will rise up again, then we, who are alive and remaining, will be caught up together with them in the clouds into the air to meet the Lord. And so we will be with the Lord forevermore. 1 Thessalonians 4 15-17 We therefore confess in this seventh article, that we believe there will be an end of all things in this world, and that the felicity of the wicked will not endure forever. For we believe that God is a just God, who has given all judgment to his Son, to repay to everyone in that day according to his works, pains to the wicked, that will never be ended and to the godly, joys everlasting. And so, in this article we profess that we look for a deliverance, a ceasing from troubles, and the reward of life everlasting. For how could he destroy those who believe in him, his people and his servants? Him who in the most true gospel says, Truly, I say to you, that you who have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the seat of his majesty, you also will sit upon twelve seats judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew 19.28 There are most certain rewards and penalties appointed for the godly and the ungodly in the word of truth. He cannot lie who said to Isaiah, Say to the righteous, that it will go well with him, 
for he shall enjoy the fruit of his study. But woe to the wicked, it will be evil with him, for he shall be rewarded according to the works of his own hands. Isaiah 3 10 and 11. And this much touching the second part of the Creed. Now we have come to the third part. The eighth article our belief is this, I believe in the Holy Ghost. This third part of the Creed contains the property of the third person in the Reverend Trinity. And we rightly believe in the Holy Ghost, as well as in the Father and the Son. For the Holy Ghost is one God with the Father and the Son. And faith in the Holy Ghost is rightly joined to faith in the Father and the Son. For by him the fruit of God's salvation, fulfilled in the Son, is sealed to us, and our sanctification and cleansing is bestowed on us, and derived to us from him, by the Holy Ghost. For the Apostle says, God, who anointed us, is the one who also sealed us, and has given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 1 21 and 22 And again, you are indeed defiled with naughtiness, but now you are cleansed, and sanctified, and lastly, justified through the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6 11. The Father indeed sanctifies too, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he pours the same sanctification out of him into us, by the Holy Ghost. So that as it were, it is the property of the Holy Ghost to sanctify, this is why he is called Holy, or the Sanctifier. Therefore, so often as we hear the Holy Ghost named, we must then think of the power in working, which the Scripture attributes to Him, and we must look for the benefits that flow to us from Him. For the power, operation, or action of the Spirit, is whatever the grace of God works in us through the Son, and so, of necessity, we must believe in the Holy Ghost. And in this eighth article we profess that we truly believe that all the faithful are cleansed, washed, regenerated, sanctified, enlightened, and enriched by God with diverse gifts of grace for Christ's sake, yet it is through the Holy Ghost. For without Him there is no true sanctification. This is why we should not attribute these gifts of grace to any other means. This glory belongs to the Holy Ghost only, of whom I will more largely and fully discourse in my other sermons. The hour is spent, which warns me to wrap up briefly and make an end. Therefore I exhort you all to have your faith religiously bent upon the Lord Jesus. For the Heavenly Father has sent him to us, and in him he has wholly expressed and shown himself to us, and the Holy Ghost imprints him in our hearts and keeps him in our minds. And in Christ, all man's salvation and every part of it is contained, thus we must beware that we do not derive it from anything else. It pleased the Father, says the Apostle, that all fullness should dwell in the Son, and in Him to recapitulate, and as it were, to summarize all points of salvation, so that in Him all the faithful may be fulfilled. For if salvation is sought, then even by His very name we are taught that salvation is in His power, for he is called Jesus, that is, a Savior. If we desire the Holy Spirit of God in his sundry gifts, we shall find them also in the anointing of Christ. For he is called Christ, the Anointed, I say, the Holy of Holies, and the Sanctifier, or the Anointer of us with his Spirit. If any man needs strength and might, power and deliverance, well, he has to look for it in Christ's dominion, for Christ is Lord of all. In this same Christ we find redemption, for he has redeemed us, we who were sold under Satan's yoke. In his conception we have purity, in his nativity we have sufferance, or he became like us that he might suffer grief as we do. For in his passion we have forgiveness of sins, in his condemnation we have absolution, in his offering or cleansing sacrifice we have satisfaction we have cleansing in his blood, and a universal reconciliation in his descending into hell. In his burial we have the mortification of our flesh, the newness of life, or rather the immortality of the soul, and in his glorious resurrection, we have the resurrection of our bodies. We also have the inheritance of the heavenly kingdom, with the assured sealing of it, 
in his ascension, and in his sitting at the right hand of the Father. And there he is our mediator, priest, and king, our safeguard, and our head, our defender, and most sure rest. From there he pours into us his Holy Spirit, the fullness of all good things, and he communicates himself wholly to us, joining us to himself with an indissoluble knot. From there, with confidence and joy, we look for him to be our judge to be our patron and deliverer, I say who will condemn and send headlong down into hell, all our enemies with Satan. But he shall take us and all the faithful of every age, up into heaven with himself, there to sing a new song, and to rejoice in him forever. To him be glory forever. Amen.